God, oh, are you blessed this evening? Hallelujah. Are you excited this evening? Are you expecting this evening? Say, I'm expecting something good. Something good. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say, I'm expecting something good. Are you? Glory to God. You may be seated. Hallelujah. We are in for a treat tonight. Amen. Glory to God. Well, I have the distinguished privilege of introducing to you one of our board members, Pastor Patrick Norris, and you guys are in for a treat tonight. Amen. I'm telling you, turn your expectors on. Amen. We're drawing on that gift that's inside him, that anointing, that gift that God placed on him way before the foundation of the world. He planned it out just for tonight. Amen. So we're coming with our expectors turn on, and we're going to draw on that gift of God, and I want you to give him a warm, glorious, slight welcome. Amen? Yeah. Glory to God. <laughs> Woo! Yay! Can I come out from behind the pulpit? Yeah. Would that be all right? Well, hello, y'all. Hi, y'all. And it's good to see you guys. What an honor it is to be here. I uh, just have an un... Uh, un- uh, believable. Uh, I, I'm at a loss for words at how much Pastor Skip and Pastor Karen have meant to my life. Um, I met them for the very first time in 1988, so a few days ago. And I remember the first time I spoke at the church that they were attending, and they were on the front row. And they just made me feel like I was the greatest preacher in the world. Amen. And I, I probably at the time was 20, I would, I would guess I was 23 years old. And, uh, and so I'm just going after it, teaching faith. And they are lit up. And if you know Mary Frances Varallo, she was sitting right next to them. And if you know Beth Wilson, she was sitting right next to them. And, uh, and it was just one of those deals where it's like, wow, these people, they got, they got some, something that is making, making my heart come alive. And over the next few years, got to be around them on multiple occasions. And then uh, we began Patrick Norris Ministries. Our 501c3 was established. And you know I had to have me some skip up on my board. Skip was a guy that I often would refer to as a 501c3 expert. I would say he can, can quote 501c3 law like many of us quote scripture. And in fact, I think he could do it better than we quote scripture. Uh, but his friendship to me was very, very dear. Uh, we traveled uh, to various boards that we sat on together and we would coordinate schedules, meet up in Chicago, Atlanta, wherever. And then we would uh, take the last leg, and it was every year such a, a, a joy. And uh, Pastor Karen and her whole spiritual vibe, I mean, wait, just wait in God. And I uh, remember various occasions praying with her. I remember times of conversation over the phone, and every conversation uh, it just felt like we together had something in God that was very unique. And so it, for me, is an honor to serve on the board when I was first approached uh, to be a part of this church's board of directors. Uh, how in the world could I think of any other answer than sure, absolutely, be honored, be thrilled, and jumped in with both feet and uh, counted it out of all the people that Pastor Skip and Karen knew uh, that they would invite me to, to be a part of their vision, very, very humbling. And so it's very humbling for me to minister to you tonight. 
and to be with our great friends. It's just I, Scott and Loretta, Pastor Scott and Loretta. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we we spoke. I spoke for them in their church in Sweden, and we said that was 24 years ago, 23. Yeah, it's like when we were in grade school, and, <laughs> and so it's so fun to get to hang out with these guys again, and it feels to me like we hadn't been apart. Um, we've talked a few times on the phone, but I have such high regard for them, and so it's so cool to be tonight here and enjoying them. And uh, finally got to spend some time getting to know uh, Paul, and what an honor. Love this guy. He's, he's cool. He's, he's got muscles. And... You have them too, brother. Uh, where are they, man? I dig around down in there and I can't find them. But we're changing that, aren't we? In Jesus' name. Um, but uh, anyway, I love uh, Paul's spirit and uh, have so enjoyed him hosting us today. And I also want to thank Karen, who uh, was taking care of There you are in the front row. You, you were back there a minute ago. But thank you for taking care of us today and just making us feel right at home. Well, I, uh, I, I've got some things that are stirring in my heart. And just to kind of give you a vibe, I'm kind of spontaneous. Uh, um, I, uh, I'm at my best when I just flow out of my well. And uh, don't always say that at my church. I rarely ever, nobody ever hears me say that, but that's what I do. Um, I do tell the video team, we have uh, video screens and all that, and I tell them, um, anything I give you, I reserve the right to not do. Um, I'll give them notes and et cetera, uh, sometimes. And then there's a lot of times I don't give them anything and just say, try to keep up. And, uh, and they do a great job of keeping up. But uh, today, I've had uh, a four and a half hour drive here, and I've listened to several podcasts, and uh, fed my own heart, fed my mind, and uh, then I meet Pastor Scott and Loretta, and they fire hosed me, and uh, just great conversation, great thoughts, and uh, just being around somebody who thinks, and processes, <laughs> and prays, <laughs> it's true, just to... Uh, to hang out with people who love the depth of things in the Spirit of God and love uh, to think outside of trends and expected, what I'll even call sometimes ruts. Um, and I don't mean that to be ugly or to demean, but sometimes we, we don't ever progress any further than where we are because we refuse to think outside of what we heard yesterday. And what we heard yesterday doesn't have to contradict what we're learning today, that's the nature of revelation. In fact, revelation knowledge is considered progressive. In any mainline doctrinal theological uh, foundation, you're going to come across something called progressive revelation. And progressive revelation means that when the book of Genesis was written, not everything God knew was captured. Right. And not everything that he wanted you and I to know was captured. Right. And so it builds from Genesis to Exodus, and you move all the way through, and you get more light. And incidentally, here's a key that will help you in your entire Christian life, especially when you're at Starbucks talking to somebody who has a religious and Christian background, but has been trained maybe in other disciplines and in other vantage points or in altering or conflicting theological or doctrinal positions. You'll hear them you know, say things about uh, Job. For instance, well, you know what the Bible says about Job and how the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, right? And they're sincere, and you appreciate the love of their heart. And there's things that we can learn in their walk with God that we don't have and that we don't know. So we celebrate the great that they have, but that doesn't then equate to what they are saying now about Job is accurate, right? right? I, and here, I'm assuming on, on Wednesday night tonight, that I have a certain level of comprehension about when I say that about Job, that you guys know what I'm talking about. So what you have then, and this is fascinating to me, is you have people in throughout Christianity, even big name, high influencers that, again, can know God in ways that are so richer, much richer and deeper than what I do or maybe you as well. Uh, and yet on some of these components, you're like, wow, how did... 
I'm like, wow, how do you not understand that different? Mm -hmm. And so when we, when we look at Job, for instance, what traditional Christianity does is takes the book of Job, establishes that as the higher revelation, uses it as a, a light, I will call it a, a beam of light or a flashlight, and then shines it into the New Testament and interprets the New Testament with Job revelation. What progressive revelation is, is that you interpret the entire Bible from the established position of your greatest revelation. Yes. And the greatest revelation we have in the Bible is called redemption. Yes. Amen. And so what you do is you take redemption, understanding what Jesus did, purchased for us, what is the legal right in the character, in the holiness, in the justice of God, what Jesus purchased so that God could retain an absolute position of holiness and an absolute position of justice, an absolute position of love, and then buy us back, bringing to us all that is in Christ. And because of what we have in Christ, now we can say we are the redeemed. We're not trying to get redeemed. It's an accomplished, possessed fact. So we take that, and now that's the greatest revelation in the progression. And we now then turn that flashlight, and we say, now I'm going to go investigate and explore Job. And as we shine the light of what we find in redemption on Job, all of a sudden we come to the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, and we're like, hmm, that doesn't fit with redemption. And so now I have to understand there's got to be more to this picture than what I first glanced at. And, of course, what you begin to realize is that Job was the very first book of Job. You know the real. Job was the very first book that was ever written. It was written before the book of Genesis. Job didn't get to read Job chapter 1. Job had no revelation of the devil. He had no understanding of any of the things going around his life. And so in a point of desperation, suffering, and pain, he just assumed. He just processed mentally, it must be the Lord. I don't know of any other players. I don't know there's a devil. That's right. And so he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, which is an accurate recording of a statement Job made, but the statement Job made is not an accurate truth. Right. Amen. Well, we would never be confronted with that if we didn't have the greater revelation of, uh, of, uh, the book of, of redemption. Anyway, that's your hors d'oeuvre. So um, today as we were talking about various things, we got several courses that we may get into. <laughs> Um, but as we've, we, we were talking today, there's just several things kind of stirring around in my heart that I'd like to share with you. And I think I, I want to just begin with this thought. So what I just told you, I didn't begin yet. So I'm just now beginning. Right. Here's yeah. this thought. You ready? Yeah. This thought is when God created human beings, he created them to be relational. Yes. A major component of relationships mm -hmm. is the power of choice. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. That God created humanity with the capacity of free moral agency. Mm -hmm. Just as a little rabbit trail and we won't go too far off on it, but when God created Adam and Eve, he endowed Adam and Eve with choice. That's the whole story of them uh, rebelling against God, eating of the forbidden fruit, and then in the day they ate thereof, they surely died, right? Amen. And so they were endowed with free moral agency. Some people say, well, if God knew that they were going to rebel, why did he make them, or why did he create a universe where the capacity for his creatures could rebel against him and then put us into this tailspin of suffering that this fallen world presents? Why would he do that? Well, there is enormous assumptions in those questions. One of the enormous pieces of the assumption is that God could create a universe and allow for free moral agency without the capacity of rebellion. You cannot create a free world with free moral agents who can freely choose and not give equally the capacity to rebel against God. The beauty of that is, is that if people, if, if human beings could rebel against God, then when they love God, they love God out of an exact choice yeah. and intent. I intend to love God. Yeah. Otherwise, what we are is a bunch of human beings that walk around saying we love God, 
but there's no real authenticity at the root of it. So God creates human beings with choices and the ability to make those choices. When it comes to salvation, we have a choice to accept Christ or reject Him. We don't have the power to walk through redemption isolated in our own choices, but we do have the power as the grace of God engages our choice bank, our ability to choose. He then empowers that choice, but the choice is still ours, whether we're going to reflect His power and receive the gift of salvation or not. We have a choice. And when we want to override some other human being's choice or control them, we're violating the structure of nature. God created beings to not be dominated in their free moral agency. And yet, in so many of our lives, we try to dominate another person's choice. We manipulate, we put pressure, we endeavor to confront them with such uh, absolutes that if they don't do what we want, then there's ultimatums around it. And that's something that's interesting that God himself won't do. God himself won't dominate a human will, and yet we sometimes think that we should. Have you ever thought about the difference of covetousness and envy? We, both, we know that both of them are works of the flesh. Both of them are, are sins. But you ever thought about what the difference is of covetousness and envy? Covetousness is when I desire to have something you own, a material thing that you own. Envy is I desire to own your choice. And where there is strife and envy, envy and strife, there is every evil work. The enemy begins to break down humanity and create suffering at the point in which there's not an honor on free moral choices. Now, in leadership, leadership is influence. And when we lead, we're influencing. And God created every Christian with a capacity to influence. And the Spirit of God, aren't you glad He influences you? He comes upon your heart and He draws you to Jesus. He draws you before the Father. He influences you, but He stops exactly at the point in which you have the power to choose and He will not control it. He will not dominate it. He will not make you. He will not make you get up and read your Bible. He won't make you talk right. He won't make you forgive. He won't make you give. He won't make you do anything. He'll influence you, love you, support you, draw you in. But the choice God will always honor with you. Amen. So anytime you screw with free moral agency in another human being, you immediately are opening the devil, open the door to the devil and confusion and every evil work. What is confusion? Confusion is where you have a mixture of various things. You see, you're confused when you have ideas that are possibly true, and that conflicts with ideas that maybe aren't true, and you're trying to figure out how that, that's confusion. Deception is, is when it's all absolutely wrong. So confusion's a mixture. Where there is envy of trying to screw with human choice, when you're trying to manipulate, when you're trying to power up, when you're taking the position of dominance over another human being, yeah. you immediately are taking the posture that allows the enemy to come in and to create a mixture, a confusion in your life, and that then creates every evil work. And the every evil work just grows, thrives in the framework of relationships. God wants us to influence. He wants us to get in the lives of people. He wants us to love. He wants us to serve. He wants us to share opportunities, to negotiate. He wants us to create the option list with one another. And He wants to give us the opportunity where we can say, you know, you create these choices, you're going to get these consequences. That is true. That's going to happen. Truth and spiritual law are going to play out. And so we have the capacity to influence, but we don't have the God-given right to control. Now, 
If you will, just for a second, let's, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. I want you to look at a scripture, maybe in a way that is different than you've looked at it before. Matthew chapter 18. And while you're turning there, God is a relational being himself. And in John chapter 17, Jesus prays his very last prayer. I don't know about you, but if I'm getting ready to go to Calvary's cross, I'm in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I get to pray my last prayer. And everything that is in the future of this dream I've had in my heart organizationally, this thing called the church that's getting ready to, to be launched, if I'm Jesus, I'm in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I'm praying... And this is my last prayer, and this prayer is going to get recorded. There's, I got some things I'm thinking I'm going to be praying for. <laughs> uh, the very first thing I'm going to pray for, because I, I need this entrepreneurial opportunity to blow up big. I need, it to go, I need this to go big. I need our initial public stock offering to go crazy. I need it to be off the charts. So the first thing I want to do is I pray. This is me. If I'm praying this, I start out with, okay, I'm about to be crucified, and I'm going to be raised from the dead, but Father, here's my prayer. That is the last prayer before I get crucified. Here's it is. I, I want to pray for this movement. We need money. <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. Is that not true? First, first thing you would address the Lord about is, you know, Lord, we could really pull this off. We had the funds. So you got some rich people you can send our way? <laughs> Second thing you'd pray for is human resource. God, if we just had a bunch of talented people, yeah. we need all the seats on the bus filled, and we need to be able to conquer this whole entrepreneurial event that we're calling Christianity. We need to market it around the world. And by the way, if we need that, if you could just throw a little technology a few thousand years early and allow us to blow it up over the airwaves and get it on TV, and there's going to be iPhones coming in 2,000 years, just spin that back and let's launch it now. I, Jesus, iPhones, come on. If you're praying like I would pray, wouldn't that be some of the things you might pray for? Now, here Jesus is in the garden. What's he praying for? In John chapter 17, his prayer is, Father... I just want you to be glorified. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And God, just as we are one, yeah. one meaning not yeah. two, right. as we are one, yeah. there's going to be people who are believing on the word and the disciples you gave me, them too, and then the ones who will hear the word from them. We, I ask yeah. you, make them one as you made us one. Yeah. Now, in that prayer, you see some profound things. First thing you see is that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one. They're not in competition. Amen. There is no edging. There is no, I'm going to power up on top of you. you. There is no, okay, I was going along with the two of you for a while. <laughs> That's good. But now y'all are ganging up, and I just always feel like I'm victimized. <laughs> Nobody in the Trinity is ever talking about the victim chair. Never. And nobody's powering up, and nobody's, nobody's condemning or comp competing against one another, right? This is God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is oneness. Oneness. And then he says, may the followers of me be one. It's like, Jesus, get to the money prayer. We're running out of time here. The verses in John 17, are, uh, we don't have much more landing strip. We better get this prayed. Money, remember money. And Jesus is like, no, no. If, if they, if the Spirit of God can make people one, the war, and this is what he said, that the world may know that you sent me. It's amazing. So in Matthew chapter 18, we have some interesting verses about relationships. And look in verse 15. Moreover, if your brother trespasses against you, go and beat on his head and find five people that are as ticked off as you are. Build a big case and a momentum around it. No, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If 
he hears you, you've gained a brother. And if he doesn't hear you, then here's what you do. Go take with you one or two more, and then in the mouth of two or three witnesses, still in a private kind of framework, then things can be established, things can be communicated through. And then if he neglected to hear them tell it to the whole church, then it, it moves up. And if he neglect to hear the church, let him go unto the heathen man and the publican. And then he says in verse 18, Verily I say unto you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Is there anybody like me who reads that whole context and you're like, okay, we're in a conflict resolution seminar. He's telling us what to do whenever there's conflict in a church. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, wait, wait, we're in a prayer seminar. Because immediately we jump to verse 18 and he says, whatever you bind on earth. And we know the prayers of binding and loosing. And, and so we were in conflict resolution and wow, we were soaking it up. But somebody needs to tell me when we are switching type, uh, topics and now we're talking about prayer, right? Now let's back up and let's think about this for a minute. He's talking about relationships and he's talking about human interaction and free moral agents in conflict. And he's giving principles to healthfully process through how relationships can function. Somehow in our Western mindset, we've even taken that and we powered up on it and said, I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell the pastor and I'm, you're, you're in trouble. Just like a little immature kid who tells on a sibling, right? That isn't what he's talking about. He's giving principles here where there can be a healthy restoration. The emphasis is on restoration. The emphasis is not on who's right. The emphasis is on the process so that we can become one again. Amen. And you know you don't have to agree to be at one again. And so he then hits verse 18, For verily I say to you that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Now we know that as we talk about prayer and the prayer of binding and loosing, technically the prayer of binding and loosing, as you play it out, is nothing more than the execution of spiritual authority. It is actually a human being rising up with free moral choice to say, wait a minute, it doesn't have to be this way. The way we've heard binding and loosing, this is actually how it plays out, that I bind or I loose because there is an enemy and I don't have to allow him to do what he wants to do in my life. Amen. And so I execute spiritual authority to create a boundary around me. So did you see where I went with that? Binding, boundary. The execution of the God-given ability to choose. And who we are in Christ now, we have this empowerment that is bigger than just us to choose what level of invasion the enemy and the level of fruit the enemy can have in our lives. Amen. So he's talking here in one dimension of this thing we could call boundaries. One translation says, whatever you allow on earth, heaven will also allow. One says, whatever you prohibit on earth will be prohibited. And this is the beauty of what we know of interpersonal relationship boundaries. That I don't have to let you invade my life as another human being. And when we talk about the enemy invading your life and binding and loosing, one of the major strategies the enemy plays in our lives is to work through other human beings. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rules of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So what happens is if somebody's going to yield, right. 
And when they yield to the enemy and whatever is exploding in their lives, then they want to come and they want to then create havoc towards you. And sometimes they power up to try to dominate. Sometimes they create a victimization attitude towards you. And then you come along and you're like, oh, now then I'm all undone and now I'm going to be a codependent to their attitudes. And so we come undone and we end up generating all of this confusion and every evil work. And what God is saying is, is that you have free moral choice to allow and to disallow. And rather than sit on your laurels, which we all have done, and tell the Lord about how much we're suffering because things that people are perpetrating in our lives, we're allowing that to happen. God says, wait, time out. I'm giving you... And this is Jesus' words in Matthew 16, upon this rock of revelation, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he immediately says, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Whatever a free moral agent will bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you allow, heaven will allow. This is the beauty of a Christian. This is the beauty of church. This is the beauty of living in healthy relationships. I do not have to allow anybody to do anything in my life that I have authority over. Not just spiritual authority like, devil, I bind you. I'm talking where if you decide you're going to be toxic in my life, I don't have to power up to put you in your place, and I don't have to become victimized by what you're doing. I can step out of the drama and the confusion and the evil work, and I can say, wait a minute, I'm going to act like an adult here that's got free moral choice, and I'm going to refuse to get caught up in the mess. I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to review my options, and then I'll negotiate with the people where I want to negotiate. I will not be forced to do anything or say anything or believe anything. I'm not going to allow you to take all of your funk and then somehow transfer it onto me and make me feel like that something's wrong with me. Right. Come on. Now, now, what happens is that in every dysfunctional cycle of families, you will have somebody in the family take one of three roles. And I'm not talking from the hip. This is clinical. It is research that's been done on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of marriages. And then family units. And the destruction that spins from the dysfunction. And when you see somebody who's in a lifestyle of uh, maladaptive behavior... We look at the person with a maladaptive behavior, but we don't look at the family systems that the enemy is wreaking havoc on, and we think the family systems are normal because that's the way my mama and daddy did it. It's the way grandma and grandpa did it. It's the way my in-laws did it. And believe it or not, here's another piece of information that you might find interesting, that who you're attracted to is based on a template of your own dysfunction that you know that it's comfortable. If my family's dysfunctional in the way that it interacts, that's comfortable to me. It's not chaotic to me because I know where people are dysfunctional. It's predictable what they're going to do. So I'm around somebody else and it's like, I just love you. I just feel so at home with you. That's going to show up somewhere in your life, I promise you. It's going to come to the surface, and then you're going to be like, well, that thing that was so comfortable, now it irritates the hound out of me. And so in these relationship systems, in the family systems, in the marriage system, in the parenting systems, In all of these systems that are swirling around your life, God has given us the capacity to develop boundaries. Praise the Lord. (laughs) And see, in in natural properties, we understand boundaries. Right? Now, let's just uh, talk about real estate. The home that you live in, you generally know within a few inches of what your property line is, right? Right? So if somebody comes from another part of Tulsa and wherever uh, it is, we'll even say Kansas City because that's where I'm from. Somebody comes from Kansas City and they roll in and they set up a tent in your backyard. 
And then they come knock on your door and say, we're neighbors. <laughs> and then you see a cement truck pulling up in the back. And you hear that beep, 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 beep. And they're about to lay the foundation of their new house. How many of you are going to be like, how, really, how many of you are going to sit there and be like, uh, okay. You're not, are you? You realize there is a boundary, there is right, and there is wrong. Well, let's see, it's easy when it's real estate. But let's say that we're at a Starbucks and you've never seen me before. You don't even know who I am, right? And because you don't know who I am, I just walk by and you're not even paying attention. Everybody look ahead, just look straight to the wall because that's the way you are at Starbucks. Just look straight ahead. And I'm just a stranger and I come up and I start rubbing your head. <laughs> How many of you know there was a boundary that just got violated? Yeah. Yeah. Is that not right? How many, of you, how many of you'd look at that and be like, that's not right. No, get your hands off my head. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Sure you would. Yeah. And if you didn't say it, what you would be thinking is, is you know what? I don't have to put up with you putting your hand on my head. Right. And you would remove yourself. If you're healthy, or, right. or you'd sit there and just start laughing and be like, now this is funny. Somebody get a camera. I just, this is going to be on YouTube. We can make some bucks off this. Thank you. Now, what if, what if you don't know me? You're in Starbucks. What if I come and sit by you and I get right up here? That's uncomfortable. Even right now, you know I'm here. You know I'm on the board of this church. This is just weird. <laughs> Why? I violated a boundary. <laughs> yes. Amen. I violated a boundary. Now, when we do these things, this is what happens. And gosh, time is rolling, but if you'll let me finish this up, I believe I will give you some tools that will help you. Okay, here we go. Here we go. You shout me down. It's taking time. Okay, here we go. So as I put my hand on his head and start rubbing it, I violated his boundary. Uh -huh. He's going to take one of two postures. He's either going to become the victim. Hmm. And here, I'm not asking whether he's becoming a technical legal victim. I'm asking whether he's self-identifying as a victim. Hmm. Hmm. Those are different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. He's either going to be a victim or he's going to take a dominant role. <laughs> and not just with healthy anger, not just with healthy anger saying stop. If he is in the dominant role, he's going to absolutely dominate me as I'm doing this and crush me down into submission. And it's not enough just to get your hand off my head. Now, I am going to make you comply to what I want. So it might come out as I'm dealing with an outburst of rage. I might, bam, that's the perpetrator. I might... I might pull a gun out and shoot you, <laughs> show you. So I'm going to take one of those two postures. The only other option, the third posture, is to be a codependent, and that doesn't play in it yet. But there's going to be somebody in your family. You can think of them right now because what will happen is, is if you have a third player, the third player, so first player lays hands or just rubs the head, violates a boundary. We got a victim. And then there's a third player that comes in and just feels so sorry. I just, I want to hug you. And then you get mad at the other one. I want to hug him because now I know he violated a boundary, but I just, I don't like anybody feeling hurt. And I think it hurt his feelings to not be able to rub his head. I mean, yeah. and so you have one of those three, the victim, the perpetrator, or you might have the codependent, the nurturer, who's just constantly running around trying to fix everybody. Yeah. As long as you are in this triangle, the victim, the perpetrator, or the other point of nurture codependent, as long as you have that, then you have an outburst of unhealthy emotions that you were not designed to manage. Amen. Yes. As long as you are processing internally these emotions inside the circle, if you self-identify as a victim, what do I mean by self-identify? Well, if you... If you look at people who survived the Holocaust, and there was one lady I watched, uh, Anthony Robbins interviewed her. 
She was a Holocaust survivor. And what happened to her and her family and her siblings and her mom and dad, I just, uh, words can't describe the grief that she encountered. So she's now in her, you know, 90s or early 100s, and Anthony Robbins is interviewing her about her spirit and her ability to survive. And, and as she reflects back, listen, she doesn't repress any of the emotions of her past. She doesn't act as though it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. She simply processes through it, and she begins to say, but you know, isn't it wonderful? Uh, just the way she would say, isn't it wonderful how that after all these years, what has happened in my life? What she was is a legal, technical victim, but she would not self-identify as a victim. She was in the triangle and could have victimized her life for the rest of her life and said, I just was done wrong and my life is screwed up. I can never be anything. I'm a victim. And had she done that, and this is what happens, when you self-identify as a victim, your neurochemistry explodes and you begin to deal with anger, but there is a healthy anger. This is not healthy anger. This is what we would term as rage. Rage surfaces up. Anxiety surfaces up. And then uh, grief. You feel grieved. And it's this constant. So as long as you are in the victim's chair, you are constantly dealing with this undercurrent of grief, of grief, of grief, of grief, of grief. I'm grieved. I just feel this deep grief. And then because of the way you've been victimized, you deal with this heavy shame. And the shame that you have inside of you is so deep and so wide and so powerful that you're constantly trying to avoid it. You're trying to constantly move away from it. You're constantly trying to manage it. You're trying to figure out, why do I feel this way? Why do I feel this way? And so in Word of Faith circles, which I am a major voice component preacher, I'm, the, I'm a faith guy. But in word of faith circles, we think to walk by faith and not by our feelings means that you repress the feelings. No, you don't repress them. You simply let them breathe. And then as they're breathing, you turn to the word and say, it's interesting as a spectator to experience this thing called emotion. But it is not my truth. And I'm not going to feel guilty because I have an emotion. I'm just not going to let that emotion be the governing factor of my decision making. And so you have this emotion inside of you as a victim where you're dealing with, I've self-identified, it explodes the neuro. And here's the thing about if you've done this, which you have, if, you, if, you, if you're wondering if I'm talking to you, I am. And as this happens in your brain, if you allow that over your lifetime, which everybody has, Unless you have an extraordinary family that God just protected you from all of that, which I haven't met that person yet. <laughs> that if, if you're alive, you've had that explosion happen in your brain and it's happened to where, and this is a technical medical term, it now is a disease of the brain. And the neurochemistry is so out of whack that you don't even know why, and you get triggers of it through your day. Somebody looks at you, somebody rejects you, somebody doesn't involve you. You come to church and you think everybody's having fun at church, but you're the only one that's not. And you have this enormous explosion happening off of a trigger and you deal with this grief and it's just deep and the emotions are so riveting that every muscle and tissue and every organ of your body is responding to it. And to you, it is the only reality possible. And it's not. It's not. You at any moment can say to yourself, as you should, and everybody say it after me, I am not a victim. I am, not a victim. I am lovable. I am, lovable. I am favored. I am favored. 
and then take a step outside the triangle of drama and step into the circle of boundaries where you take responsibility, you assess your options, and you negotiate where necessary. But what you're doing is saying, this is my boundary, this is my real estate, and nobody's allowed to just come in and do what they want to do, and nobody's allowed to come in and manipulate me, nobody's allowed to come in and dominate me, nobody's allowed to come in and tell me that I'm not all that because I don't fit whatever their template of that is. Tell me I'm not all that. That's interesting. Wow. High five you. I'm stepping out of that. I'm going to let you circle in the circle of drama. I'm going to let you implode. I'm not playing the game. I'm outside of it. Whatever I bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever I loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It's amazing. It's amazing. So let's go just a couple more minutes. So, so here's, here's what's amazing. So I rub his head. I violate his boundary. And because of the nature of the way the family dynamics are, now I'm, I'm moving me beyond just a stranger, he feels like I can't do anything. And he self-identifies as a victim. He has this explosion of emotion. And you begin to ask him, how does that make you feel? And he says this, I don't feel like I can do anything. Whatever I do, it doesn't work. It's like nobody hears me. I say, don't do, don't rub my head. And they rub my head. <laughs> it seems like everywhere I talk, I'm invisible. And the only time somebody wants to talk to me is when they rub my head. <laughs> and I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Can you just feel the grief? Yeah. Yes. Can you feel the rage? Can, can, can you feel the shame? Mm. Because I shouldn't be this way. Right. Something's wrong. And shame, incidentally, is not what you do, it's who you believe you are. Mm. You're only guilty for the things you do, you're shameful about the things you believe you are. Mm. And how many of you know Jesus made you who you are Amen. in a way that is shameless? Amen. Come on now. Amen. So, we've got all these phrases. I just feel like nobody listens to me. I just feel like, I just feel like. So, the question is, when you say that, you're saying that you are completely helpless. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you first felt this helpless? Mm -hmm. Where you couldn't do anything about anything? How old were you? Well, he's probably going to come back with four or five. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm going to say to him, you internally are identifying in the emotional maturity of a four or five year old. Hmm. Right. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's just now it's not just a family member. This might be your boss. It might be your mama. It could be your mama. It could be your daddy. And you feel like, I got nothing. I can't do anything. I just hate it when things turn out the way it's turning out. I, nobody listens to me. Everybody takes advantage of me. And so what you're doing is you're saying, I'm emotionally a five-year-old on the inside, and that's the only maturity I can respond to this with. Wow. <laughs> right? And so this is the way family dynamics work. So then, if I'm the one who laid hands and wouldn't stop, and I'm not listening to him and all that kind of stuff, then if I'm asked, so you just heard that what you did to him, he now feels so helpless that he's identifying emotionally as a four or five year old. And you say to me, how's that make you feel? And then I think, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I just wanna hug you. You haven't made your bed in five years because you're so depressed. And now all I wanna do is help you not make your bed. And you haven't bathed and you don't do anything. You don't go to the gym, you don't eat right. You don't do anything right. And I just want to hug you because I feel like I've been a bully to you. And so now I've moved from perpetrator to now I'm the codependent. Wow. 
And this stuff just cycles. And the emotional stuff that explodes inside of us is so powerful that the number of people, I'm, I'm going to identify, I'm, I'm going to uh, put it in the framework of church. How many people go to church and they feel like nobody notices me? Nobody loves me. Nobody listens to me. And when they're saying that, the very fact they're saying it, what they've just done is said, I self-identify as a victim. Yep. Mm. Everywhere I go, I'm a victim. Yep. If I ask somebody, hey, I've tried. You know, there's couples in the church, and I've tried to, my wife and I, we've tried. We've called three or four of them, and we've asked them out to dinner. Nobody wants to go out to dinner. Mm-hmm. And so we're just done. Oh, okay, okay. How old were you when you first didn't get your way and you said you're done? <laughs> oh, man. Because what you have done is believe that it's impossible now for you to live in this framework when in the exact opposite is true, that if you just step out of the triangle, step into boundaries and say, okay, last four didn't want to go to dinner or they couldn't, or they had schedules. It's not my job to figure out and psychoanalyze everybody why they can, why they can't. And the fact is, we usually think they don't want to because they don't like us, and reality is they had a little league game and a a, a soccer practice, and they had 15 million things on their list, and they just didn't have time. And then because you're such a victim, that actually penetrates with a ton of emotion that they're like, oh, gosh. The reason that they talk so much when we're around them and they, they always are obsessing about themselves. Have you ever been around those people that they just talk about themselves? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, I was having this drama and then I was having this drama. And, and you're like, after an hour, you're like, would you like to know how my day was? Yeah. <laughs> Where's all that coming from? That is a, a process of medicating their own grief. They talk like that because they're striving to overcome the gnawing grief, the anger, and the shame that they're dealing with on the inside. And it's like, all you have to do is just step out of the triangle and say to yourself, I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim. I refuse to be a victim. I am more than a conqueror. I have free moral agency. The love of God is in me and on me. I am lovable. I'm favored. And I can take responsibility. And if I never go out with those four, so be it. Maybe they'll want to in a year. I don't know, but who cares? I'm going to hit up four more people. And whoever says yes, I'm going to see my options. I'm going to then negotiate where we're going to eat. And we're going to have a blast. Now, here's the benefit of that. It's not just now then how I dealt with the person. It's the emotional stability when you do that. All of the negative neurochemistry that was exploding now then gives way for emerging healthy chemistry. And you begin to feel joy. And you begin to feel peace. And you're like, oh, it's the peace of God. Yeah, it is, and it's executed through the neurochemistry of your brain because you finally stepped into a boundary that God gave you when he created human beings. It's just true, isn't it? It's that, it's that, it's that, that simple. So how long will you allow yourself to be a victim? And how long will you respond? So, because if I'm not going to be a victim, then I'm just going to dominate. And husbands and wives do this all the time. It's like he lies about the stupidest stuff. He just lies. He just lies. He lies. Cool. Pastor, get up in here and help him not lie anymore. He just lies. He just lies. Why do you lie? Because she's an anxiety bomb. If you bring up anything, she just explodes, and I ain't got the emotional room to work with it. And so what you have is you have victim perpetrator chairs in the triangle, and all they're doing is they're passing each other and saying, I don't like you. I don't like you. You're a loser. You're stupid. And they just go back and forth, back. And it's like, how long y'all going to do that? And then they come to the pastor and say, uh, we, we're struggling with communication. Call Pat Norris. Call Pat Norris. 
I'm going to refer him to somebody else. <laughs> but they come to the pastor and they say, Pastor, we got communication problems. And so what they want you to do is give them a tool, a tactical, okay, what you do is you say these words. If you, in your heart, are saying you're an idiot, but you use words articulating, I think it would be best if we didn't do that. How many of you know they don't hear it's best if we don't do that? What they hear is, you're an idiot. <laughs> so bottom line, you don't need, you do not need somebody to teach you how to communicate. You need to get out of the drama triangle, get some peace and joy back up in your life, take responsibility, look at the options you have in God and in Christ, and believe your way through it, and all of a sudden your, your whole neurochemistry, your body, and then fully from this well of your human spirit, that out of your heart, out of your spirit flows the issues of life, joy and peace and grace and freedom come out, and you're like, man, this just feels so good. It feels good. I didn't know I could feel this way. You may not know it, but I just saved you and your family thousands of dollars in therapy. <laughs> and if, and if, if some of the things I've said, because depending on what your background is, you're like, well, I don't believe in none of that. You keep talking about neurochemistry. I just, I just believe the word. <laughs> if we had time, I could take you through Romans 6, 7, and 8. I could take you through Ephesians chapter 4. And we would talk about things like the spirit of your mind and the law of your mind. We would talk about things that actually totally undergird. It's like God. Isn't it crazy? It's almost like God made us. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Amen. And in the Bible, he gave us an operator's manual. Wow. It's almost, it's, all, it's, it's close to being that. It's almost like he did that. Yeah. These things are so true. There's a book that you might be interested in called How God Changes Your Brain. Now, don't get all spiritual thinking that it's a Christian book. It's written by neuroscientists from the University of Pennsylvania that are not Christians. There's a few in the study, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists who worked uh, as neuroscientists on the project. But uh, what it does is through neuroimaging, they studied how the human brain responds to spiritual activities. And the spiritual activities were primarily done in a Christian context. So they looked at what happens when you meditate. They looked at what happens when you pray and when you worship, when you center in prayer. They watched what happens. Listen to this. This is crazy. They watched what happens in the brain when a person speaks in Pentecostal tongues. Oh, wow. I like that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And one of the neuroscientists working on the project was a tongue talker. She actually was on both sides of it. Something interesting. And it's in the book, How God Changes Your Brain by Andrew Newberg. In the book, they say that in neuroimaging, they have no activity in the brain when somebody speaks in tongues. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they had tons of uh, several, many uh, people that they studied. Mm. It's interesting. Yeah. I'm just telling you, God created you to be free, and you don't, you don't have to stress through about, an, well, if I just meditate the Word, if I just meditate the Word for about... If I just meditate the word and make about a thousand more declarations over this, I believe we'll have a breakthrough. And God's like, if you'll just use your free moral agency, the weapon I gave you, the choice, step out of the drama, take responsibility for what you have right now, and refuse to identify as the victim and say, I don't have to live here. I don't have to be here. I don't deserve to be here. God made a way for me to take responsibility and to step out of this mess and say, listen, if you guys want to argue, debate, and all the stuff that happens in the circle or in the triangle, if you want to do that, go for it. I'm going to step out here when you all get done. Come talk to me, but I'm not doing it. By the way, Dad, I ain't going on the fishing trip either. 
Dad, you've been putting pressure on me and pressure on me, and I hate fishing. <laughs> I love you. I hate fishing. And the last time it was miserable. So I love you, Dad. I would love to bless you in every way I can. I ain't going, I, I'm not going fishing. I'm not going on the big camping trip. I'm not going to sit around with all y'all stinky men doing your deal and, you know, I'm not going to do it. I'm not. Now, that's not my story. Y'all are thinking, bless his heart. Y'all were getting codependent. Bless his heart. I'm going to hug him. But that's what happens in families. What you mean? Mama says, what you mean is uh, this summer, Sunday? You, what you mean you're not coming to our house? I've already bought the groceries. <laughs> After church, you got to come eat at my house. What you mean you're not? Somebody sick? What? <laughs> you're like, no, Mama, we, we love you, and we love your cooking. But, Mama, we, 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 we're not going to be able to come over to, to, uh, this Sunday. <laughs> well, why? You have a choice. You can get caught up in the drama. Mm -hmm. <sighs> she just makes me so mad. She just won't let it go. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to go get some Ben's and Jerry's ice cream and just stew over this thing. <clears throat> or, or you power up and say, Mama, you just make me so mad. I wish you'd stop it. Just stop it. We ain't coming. Stupid. It's just stupid. We ain't get even a, an ounce of peace in our life because all you do is just nag, nag. We ain't coming. Okay. And so all the explosion in your brain just happened. And now you're dealing with shame and anger and anxiety. And you're like, oh, I'm so, I'm so bad. And then you think, I'm going to get that Ben and Jerry's again. <laughs> get up on it. You're all over it. And then you feel angry because you did that. When all you would have had to do is say, Mama, I love your cooking. And I love you. You're awesome. But we're, we're not going to be able to come. Well, why, baby? I just want to know why. <laughs> well, Mama, we, we're just not going to be able to. We don't want to. What do you mean you don't want to? <laughs> Mama, we've had, we've had a busy week, and in our minds, we feel like that it would be in our best interest to stay home this weekend. We have been gone every weekend for weeks and weeks and weeks, and we're not. Well, that ain't the way it's supposed to be, or this is what mamas do at that point sometimes. Is this? Well, okay. <laughs> and what you have to do, because right there you're you're about to either become a codependent or you're going to build a boundary. You're either going to walk over there and say, "Mama, I'm so sorry. You look hurt. We could come for 30 minutes." And so she just manipulated the hound out of you. And what you should have asked, you wouldn't ask this, but what you could have asked is, Mama, how old is the emotional person that's responding in the corner right now? Right? Now, you wouldn't say that. Maybe. Maybe. But, but all you have to do is step out of it and say, No, Mama, I'm so sorry that it hurts your feelings. I, I feel empathy. Sorry it hurt your feelings, but I'm not going to get in that drama cycle with you. If I do, and here's what you need to know. Did you know what I just described to you is the number one reason for addictions in people? That all maladaptive behavior, addictions, whether it's gambling, food addiction, sexual addictions, it's rooted in the family systems, both in the families of, your, of origin, where you were born, all the way to the families that you've now married into, and the way that those function, it nurtures anger, anxiety, and grief. 
The shame becomes at the core of it. So even when you get an addict to white knuckle discipline to become abstinent from their addiction for 90 days, 120 days, they still are going to go into a continuum of relapse. Anybody want to look at Hollywood and see any examples? Oh, yeah. They're going to go into relapse until the person deals with the trauma of the anger, which is really rage, the rage where they're blowing up. When they deal with the anxieties and when they deal with the grief, not trying to repress them, allow them to breathe, take a step out of the circle or out of the triangle into the circle of boundaries, all of a sudden that person becomes free and their brain, it takes your brain 90 days before it begins to reformat. The neurochemistry so drives channels in it that you cannot just say in one day, I'm going to behave this way. It takes 90 days of treating mama like this, where you're like, mama, I love you. And uh, we'll see you another day. I'm taking the wife and the kids. We've got to go home and let her stew. Hurts her feelings. That's, I hate that for her. I love her, but she's in a cycle I'm not going to get into. And it takes 90 days of letting that happen before your brain starts seeing the world differently. Until then, and here's something powerful for you, I'm talking on a clinical research level, your brain is damaged because of a lifetime of this, and you have distorted perceptions of the world around you, and you deal with anxieties that you didn't even know are born out of these systems, and after 90 days of living with true boundaries, your brain begins to rebuild, and as it rebuilds, all of a sudden you see the world different, and you begin to think right, you begin to believe right, and you begin to have a whole new experience in life. And it was as simple as whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for letting me get my overtime. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Isn't that fun? Yeah. Isn't that fun? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for just being an amazing, loving God that you created us in your image and in your likeness. You desire that we would commune in oneness, that we would in our family units have true intimacy. Intimacy that is not what the secular society thinks of when it thinks of intimacy, but intimacy that could be defined by a father make them one. A oneness that is spiritual, a oneness that is emotional, the Lord, we would have this capacity to know one another so rich, so deep, so beautiful. But God, it's going to require that we understand how to implement the boundaries. Thank you for revealing things to us. I believe that you brought healing to some people here tonight. I believe there's some people that have been made free of some things because of the revelation that you put in our hearts. Thank you, God. I do believe, Lord, that there's folks here who have been chasing you partly because they've been running from their own grief. And yet, God, I just would like for a moment us to just sit in your presence and to receive your grace and to feel the goodness of God upon our hearts, that you love us, you like us, you're in a good mood to us tonight, and that you want to remove that grief, not by repressing it, but by identifying that it's there, and yet realizing that our reality is not determined by our present emotion. So Lord, we just receive, receive you, receive you, Lord as the lover of our souls, that, God, we are the free and that we have the ability to choose. Tonight we choose. We are not the victim anymore. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Keep otakaste. Oh, Shabbat Akira de Gishti Yanande. O la mama kide motion yana azo de kora de gish. Atsten manare de kefa oto mashede gisht. O sh la hare. La hare bohonyan and begishtun yanande de gisho. 
Thank you, God. You know, when the Bible says out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, and he went on with the list. The heart, of course, is the center of all behavior. I believe the Lord would want you to know is these things that we've talked about tonight as you allow health and responsibility and choices as you step into things you'll find that your heart's being made whole and as it is you'll find that things that you couldn't stop before and that just you'd fly off and say things you shouldn't say and do things you shouldn't do you'll find yourself no longer acting that way and it won't be because of discipline it'll be because your heart is whole heart is whole I believe there's somebody here that you fly off in anger a lot. You hate it. You hate it. But in the moment, you can't seem to stop it. And you've, you've so believed that that you even have self-identified as a victim that it's impossible for me to change. And I just believe the Lord's saying to you, even that is a choice. It's a choice for you not to change. It's just that simple. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for marriages here. I thank you for bringing restoration, healing. God, I pray for intimacy among these people. God, this whole church family, I just pray for intimacy, intimacy, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy that isn't of natural making. It's not fabricated by our own abilities. It's not us just saying, I'm, I want to be joyful. It's God, the grace of God bringing wholeness to our hearts. So the joy of the Lord truly is our strength. I pray that over this congregation. I pray that everybody that's in this church that is looking for position and who's up and who's down and who's the victim and who's most powerful and who's got the opportunities and who to, Lord, help us tonight to just level all that out and say, I'm not going to get in the drama. I'm not going to get in it. All I'm going to do is take responsibility for that which I have choices in. I'm going to review my options and I'll negotiate where necessary. Lord, we receive you in all of your goodness. In Jesus' name.